So there's some, some cool things go, that are going on here. So here's our, here's a little grouse. And let's first just sort of analyze the, 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 the plumage here and the structure. So big picture, I've got a ball of a head and I've got a ball of a body, right? And those are then uh, sort of blended together by a flexible neck section. Underneath the, the feathers here, actually I wanna do a quick audio check. Um, Avea, how's my audio today? I know in the past we were having some problems with that. I hear you um, loud to be Okay today? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, jumping back to our bird friend here. Um, so sort of sticking out of the back of its skull, there is a, um, an S-shaped spine here that can be retracted as it is now, or it can all straighten out like this, bringing the head up to a higher position in which case you have kind of a long, thin neck. But when that head, um, when the head is tucked down, then what you see here is, you know, here, this sort of the, the, the feathers around the neck kind of puffing out like this, giving you this sort of squatter neck. So big ball of body, but there's a flexible head that could easily be bringing its head up just up like this. And we'll see in some of the subsequent photographs that they are in those positions. But you want to, when you look at a photograph, be able to kind of, in your head, be able to kind of pop that up or down. Um, at this point, I suspect Ray Bonto is sketching furiously from the screen and I suggest that everybody do the same thing, All right? <clears throat> When we uh, kind of jump over to uh, him at the end of this show, uh, we're gonna see pages filled with stuff. And again, those pencil miles, um, it, that's, that is, that's the best way to kind of uh, pop that. And we want to kind of get those pencil miles in. So you can actually be doing this while we're kind of analyzing the, the feathers here. Let's take a look at the wing and how it fits into the body. We touched a bit upon this with the duck, but um, the wing, we have two parts. There is what's called the secondary feathers, which are a block of feathers here. You can see these feathers coming down here. And then there's a whole pile of feathers about the same length. So there's a step down, and then we have a whole pile of the same length. Those are the secondary feathers. And sticking out from underneath those is this triangle of primary feathers. And what you're seeing on those uh, primary feathers is, hold on a second. What you're seeing on those primary feathers is that there's these back edges of the feathers here. And the back edges all line up along this back edge, they kind of curve down. And then the front edges come up and meet those. So now I'm gonna erase all of these annotations here and you'll be able to see that. So you see, we have the back edge of this feather here. Um, we have, hard to say, I think I'm seeing the back edge of another one right there. Definitely one here, definitely one here and there. So there are those back edges. Um, bird artist Keith Hansen taught me when I'm drawing wings, you know, imagine you have some little section over here where you've got a triangle of wingness sticking out. The, the Keith Hansen trick, oops. Keith Hansen um, showed me this, this, this lovely little trick. Uh, what he would do is, um, and by the way, Keith Hansen has a new field guide to Birds of the Sierra Nevada coming out from Heyday Books. It is going to be spectacular. Um, so he just draws in those trailing edges first into that wedge. And as you're doing that, you can be looking at the spacing of them, the number of them, and then you're just coming along and kind of bringing up to the front sort of these sort of parallel edges don't want to make it a total point, kind of round that tip there. 
And then you get that whole pile of primary feathers all do, 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 do. So that's how you get your symmetrical primary feathers. The trick for drawing the secondary feathers is that you've got your one, two, three feathers, and then you've got your whole pile of feathers the same length, right? Like that. So, but this little primary feather trick, you can sort of see that this bird was designed by Keith Hansen. Gotta check out his new, he's a wonderful bird illustrator. He's sort of my bird drawing Yoda. Clear old drawings. <clears throat> all right, so that wing business is tucked up underneath the feathers of the body. Specifically, here you see these breast feathers covering up the front edge of the wing. And then on the back, this business in here, these are the scapular feathers that are covering up the top part of the wing. So what you see sticking out from underneath that is the secondaries. And here are the rows of the secondary coverts in there. And then your primary feathers are sticking out underneath that. If all of this sort of talk about primaries and secondaries is totally new to you, um, I'm sorry for kind of, it feels like we're jumping in in the middle of a conversation and in a way we are here in previous classes, we have talked about, um, we've, we've talked about um, these, these, these groups of feathers. And so I'm sorry if I'm sort of throwing them around kind of with an expect, expectation of you already to be familiar with them. We will in future classes be kind of going over these uh, more. Um, but um, just sort of think of these as sort of the major sections of the wing. The primary feathers are the pointy tips of the wing. The secondary feathers are sort of the part of the wing that is closer to the body. And the covert feathers are, are, um, are the, the, the kind of the contour feathers on that surface of the wing. So what we've got is part of our wing here. And then you have this zone of feathers that is um, the, the feathers that are, are, are covering up that wing. So specifically your scapular feathers in there. We're gonna break down these feather groups on this bird just a little bit more. Um, so here we've got all of our, our, our breast feathers. And underneath those, underneath the feathers, there is sort of a pad of uncolored feathers down here. These are, that are underneath the tail. These are our under tail coverts. And you can see those kind of tucking up under the bottom edge of the bird. Might as well use a different color for this because I can. Um, so this bird gets pink undertail coverts. So this zone down here, those are your undertail coverts. Um, but here we see that this bird's head is extended. We already talked about that a little bit but let's just diagram this bad boy out um, a little bit. So you have a ball of the body, you have your ball of the head, and then your, your neck is extended. So you notice know, a little bit of a shelf underneath the neck, then you're kind of going down straight and locking into, into the body here. We're seeing very similar things going on with how the wing is covered up, where the breast feathers are covering up part of the wing. We have our scapular feathers covering up the top part of the wing. We have um, then some secondaries and primary feathers sticking down underneath that. Like, so now it looks like, oh my goodness, there's a totally different bird happening in here. Um, so what we, we've got here is this, if I kind of look at parts of a bird on this. Let's stop share. Um, this part here, these are what are called undertail coverts. Undertail coverts. And 
those um, those feathers are arranged in rows. You've got, whoops, that's my eraser. Draw. No, still on my eraser. Um, try this again. There we go. No, I don't want that. I want this. Okay. So here are my um, undertail coverts. If I think of this, I can kind of think of this sort of like a pine cone. Let's see. Um, so I've got these, 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 these feathers stacking up here in rows. I've got my scapular feathers up here. My wing is now um, pulled out so that it's much more of it is visible. This whole part up here are um, secondary covert feathers. This part down here, these are secondary feathers. You can see we've got one, two, three, whole pile of the same length. These are my primary feathers that are sticking out down here. This whole craziness in the neck is feathers that are around a bare skin patch that can be pulled back to reveal that sort of display area. Um, and so this gets engorged with blood, turns color. This whole area puffs up when the bird is vocalizing and these skin pouches um, appear. So sometimes it just looks like this bird has a normal bird neck. Um, but when it's displaying, this business flops open and you have that, that skin um, that is then revealed inside, uh, inside those feathers. This also, interestingly enough, is a big skin patch up here on top of the head. Um, so when it's displaying, this um, gets uh, swollen and more brightly colored and your bird um, uh, is looking really pretty. But this is cool. This is a good angle um, and will actually be useful for us um, because I want to use this just to sort of help us think about drawing a bird at a three quarter view angle. What I don't like about this one is that the, there's the breadth, these uh, belly feathers are so fluffed up over the wing. I really see none of the wing and the, the scapulars there, but this will be useful for us for making some, some, uh, some quick sketches. So let's take a look at how um, we kind of break this thing down to look at this bird from a three quarter view angle, right? Um, so here's the ball of my body. Here's the ball of my head. Um, what's going on? I am, The head is uh, sort of the, the, the neck is, is not fully extended. This little patch of feathers right here sticking out, those are feathers around the vocal patch that it can either, uh, that can, uh, are kind of flicked up here, um, but normally those are going to be a little bit more smoothed down. I'm going to get rid of that. For now, I'm going to leave it out. This stuff up here in the back, um, how do I kind of handle thinking about the foreshortening on this, this bird? Well, let's think about the, the head and the body here as big three-dimensional shapes. Actually, I'm gonna erase all of my lines and we're gonna put in some, we're gonna put in some sort of center line guides. So around that ball of the body, I want to think of where the middle of the chest is. Um, so that is coming from here. And if I drew a line right down the middle of its chest, it would cut down that way. 
So if here is the ball of my body, I'm kind of drawing this a little bit more carefully now. You see that we have a center line that comes up there. That center line, we kind of see that center line coming down here on the head. Do you see the beak comes up to that center line? And so the center line, if here is the sort of the mass of the head, that center line is coming around like that. The center line on the belly is going to be like that. So that sort of midline of my bird is going to be very, very useful to me. Now on the back here, here is where it goes. Here is the center line of the middle of the back coming down like this and then coming towards you here. So if I were to think of this bird in terms of three-dimensional forms, I would think of it as a body. I have a cone that is fitting into that, a ball on the top of that, and then I'm going to envision, um, actually, let me first put in a little bit of center line. So here's the center line on your head, down your neck, and around here. That center line is going to be disappearing around the backside of the ball somewhere in here. And we have those, um, the upper tail coverts sticking up in, I'm going to sort of uh, simplify this shape as, just a little wedge sticking up here. Imagine a here's the side of it. This is sort of a, a, a wedge of feathers that is sticking up like that. So we're seeing more of this side here where I've got this hatch hatching on the other side. This little line here I kind of think like here's the top part of it. So our center line then is coming up the middle of that. <laughs> the tail is attached onto the back part of that. And the tail, if you were looking at this from the front, you would have this kind of a shape. Um, but if the tail is, if you imagine, if you had a piece of paper that was sh sh shaped this way and you had a fold in here, so it was slightly tented and you rotated it a little bit this direction, you would see more of this surface than this surface. And so very often on a tail like this, um, if here is kind of the, one side of your tail, the other side is going to be smaller. So this side here is going to be more foreshortened away from you. So on the, a drawing like this, on a photograph like this, finding these center lines and thinking about how those change their angle and where they go across this. Um, 
bird and around and over the, this, this bird. It's really going to help you be able to draw this from an interesting and dynamic angle. First, let's start with the ball of the body. Figure out where you think the ball of this one's body is. I think we probably all are doing something like this, a little bit easier for me to draw because I'm just tracing on a screen. Where's the ball of its head? The ball of its head is here. Um, now, what about, uh, so then what we're going to do that the head isn't fully tucked down, it's not fully extended. Um, so we're kind of coming down here. This little bit of a bump here would smooth out more if the head got um, more extended out. But, but we're seeing in that neck area, a little bit of a bump right in there. Let's think about the center line um, because that is such a, um, such a useful, such a useful line. On this, the head is turned towards me just a little bit. So I am seeing my center lines are actually in from the edges of the, the bird there. And then that would be wrapping somewhere around the back of the head uh, beyond my view. And we're seeing the center line of the tail here, meaning the center line of the back coming up like this. So the center line of, we've got a slight back view here. So the center line of, on the underside, it's not, if this were a total side view, the center line would be the edge where that green line is. But it's going to be in from that just a little bit this direction. So there are my breast feathers coming down. Because it is, if we're looking at a bird and we're looking at it right from the side, where the, um, the legs would come out, they would be symmetrical. Um, so the other leg would be blocked by this leg. But if I turn this around a little bit so that Here's a slightly different view. Now, here is the center line. That means this leg is going to be coming out over here. And this leg on the other side is going to be coming out over here. So there's now going to be space between those legs. This bird is also stepping forward with one of those. So you have two of those things going on. You've got space between the legs because the bird is stepping forward and we've got a slight rotation, um, slight back view of this bird. So on the legs, what you're seeing is underneath here, there is a drumstick that is coming like this. So this bird's drumstick is just like this. Its thigh, actually spreads like this, attached to a hip in here. The thigh bone is in here. And um, if you're just used to seeing um, birds as kind of, you know, Thanksgiving birds, at Thanksgiving they cut the foot off here. But this is the rest of the bird's foot. So there is a tarsus that comes down. And um, then the birds toes go forward from that foot. This bird has three toes that go forward, none that come back. You see that a lot of ground sort of walking birds, that back toe is, 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 is reduced or lost. So here, this back foot is coming down here and doing this. And then you can see that its toes, it's starting to, to roll onto those toes coming here. 
there's a bone coming down, there's a joint here. So this part here is flat along the ground. So you're seeing a bend in that. So that's what you're seeing in those feet. This one is all flat along the ground. This one, because the weight is going forward, this part here is starting to lift up off of the ground. Just a little bit more um, anatomy on this one. See if you can see the line of where its breast feathers are. And that's what you're seeing here. The scapular feathers on this beastie are tucked up here. These are its scapulars. And that means that that area below it is the wing. Here is, here are the secondary feathers. We're seeing a lot more of this, this wing. This bird could fluff these feathers up over this wing even more, but it's not. Here are your primary feathers sticking down. These feathers that you see right in here are primary covert feathers. These feathers all up in here are secondary covert feathers. Here is the line of the middle of the back. And you'll see that there is a zone of upper tail coverts that come out over the top of the tail here. And then the rest of the rump feathers in the back coming up on top of the beastie. <clears throat> the tail feathers are out in a nice neat pile, all stacked on top of each other. When you look at it from the top, the, feather that, the feathers that are on top are the ones that are in the center. And so you see all of those feathers and then the other ones sort of tuck out underneath them. And depending, sometimes if you're looking at a bird from the top, you'll see those two central tail feathers side by side. And with all the other ones tucked underneath them. And so that, you know, if you're like, say, a, a, sometimes you'll see like this kind of an effect in the tail, right? So that means you've got these feathers here that are coming down, these ones coming here. So these two piles. Birds will sometimes also take those two piles and overlap them so that you get one side here and then you get the other side, you know, kind of tucked underneath it. So you don't expect them always to be clearly side by side on the top of the tail. And um, let's see here. All right. So that, that kind of gives me kind of a good look at a lot of this anatomy. I do want to kind of reinforce that I am seeing the center line of the head coming up in there. And the center line underneath the chin is not right at the edge of the body. Oh, one other last thing right in here. Let's just point this out. I'm going to switch colors so people can see it a little bit more easily. We'll jump over to red. These are what are called undertail coverts. Right? So you've got your breast feathers that come down in here. And then your undertail coverts stick out under the tail. And those are a series of um, of, 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 of feathers that are going to make the sort of smooth the shape of the tail into the body. This whole zone, the tail kind of can bend from a point not out here, but somewhere in here. So if this bird were to take this tail and flip it up, you would be seeing, you know, sort of from in here, 
you would be seeing your upper tail coverts coming into this, your, and then your under tail coverts kind of flipping up like that. So the, 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 the place where that whole tail kind of wobbles up and down, it's from a pivot point right in there. Now, all this looking at big picture structure is a great way to avoid dealing with all these sort of intricate patterns and things. Um, so how do you deal with this? Um, so it depends on your goals as a um, your your goals as a as a as a of, of the drawing that you're doing. If, for instance, you are saying to yourself, I want to, I'm out in the field and I'm doing a field sketch and I want to um, quickly get down this information that I'm seeing, right? So you don't have to get, you're seeing like all this complexity, like all these like, you know, darks, dark blacks, there's grays, there's little brown zones and then there are these little white things that are going over it. Like, ah, what do you do? So I'm going to show you kind of a couple of ways of quickly handling that. And then we will look at um, if you're doing more of a careful illustration where you have either dead birds, stuffed birds, photographs of birds, and you want to kind of noodle on this a little bit more feather by feather, how you might be going about doing that, right? So let's first though think about because um, my my, my, my first love is, is field sketching and field journaling. You come across something super complex like this. Don't just go like, oh my gosh, it's so complex. Forget about it. I'm gonna show you some really quick strategies to get this shape down on your piece of paper. All right, so what, what I would do is as this bird is, it first pops up in front of me, I'm gonna make a lot of fast little sketches. So, um, you know, if you've been with me before, I'm, I'm, I'm often starting just with a negative shape behind the body, putting in the body, putting in a little head, then kind of looking at the way that those little pieces kind of connect. So I might get kind of a quick sketch like, oh no, it turned, All right? So I'm going to, now here is kind of a, 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 a front view. And then like, oh, it just, there, we're gonna see it kind of briefly um, it did something kind of crazy with a fan of its tail. So I just wanted to kind of like, ooh, fan, F-A-N. Um, and the neck was high when it did that. So I'm gonna get a bunch of just little sketches. The wing was down lower. You notice in none of these have, um, None of these these have you know lots of, of detail in them. I'm just trying to get down some of the whatever kind of basic shapes I'm 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 seeing, and I'm not getting lost in all the details. But let's say this bird is sticking around for a while. And by the way, these birds. If you are where they want to be displaying, they will chase you down the trail. So you don't have to, go, oh no, I just, you know, like if they're not displaying, yeah, you, you, you just scared away the grouse. But if they're kind of into their thing and they see you, they look like, I'm sorry, um, I had a grouse chase me um, for about a half a mile. Um, this, no, that's an exaggeration. Probably. It felt like a half a mile. It was a long time, but this grouse was just right in my face and I was just where it wanted to be this blank. So that's really cool. Um, so what I would initially do is just look at the birds in terms of, um, you squint at it and you think about it in terms of 
of, of, of big sort of value areas. Um, this bird has dark throat, right? It has dark, dark on the chest. Um, the back, uh, the rest of the body is all really kind of stripey, stripey, and it has dark kind of on the, the tail. So what I'm gonna do is just, here is a simple little value study. And I'm gonna go down this way with these little marks here, kind of helping you kind of see that this is a rounded little grousey chest. That might be really reasonably what I could get. Um, you know, the, as, as this thing is kind of, you know, bopping around. <clears throat> if I want to add more detail to it, um, then, you know, you could, like you want to get detail in the head, you can do an enlargement of the head. Um, but initially, I would probably just be kind of working on you know, trying to, uh, you know, just get these big areas of light and dark. On my little grouse friend. See that kind of an objective is reasonable for fast field sketching. I can also do this. Let's say on the, the belly here, I can say um, black and white bars. And on the back, black BK and gray G uh, Y. So I'm for my abbreviations of, of, uh, of colors, I usually put the first and last letter. Um, like, you know, if you put the first two letters of the word, like green and gray and black and blue, they're all gonna come out being the same way. So put the first and last, green and gray crescents. Um, I'm gonna put in, uh, a little line out here, and it's going to say um, uh, white um, bars. And I'm gonna give a little box here that is gonna show what I mean by that, because these little white bars actually are kind of shaped like trumpets. And so I want to have people kind of notice the shape of those white bars. Oh, could you um, slide it down oh. just a little? Ah, perfect. So all I'm doing is just, you know, drawing in some of these little kind of trumpet shapes. To get myself to notice the, the shapes of those white bars. And there's an orange band um, at the base of the tail. So that is, that's a much easier way of kind of going about uh, collecting field notes. I start to add written notes in on these things and this hyper complexity becomes a lot simpler. I'm now going to take one of these studies and, oh, I've got four minutes left. In four minutes, I'm gonna draw it larger. Is this area of my paper on screen? Um, if you could just go up a little bit. 
Um, yeah, there we go. Right here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is on, on a creator that's a little bit more cooperative. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. Um, it's now we're it's kind of still below. So uh, okay, sorry. Let me see here. No, 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 no problem at all. I really appreciate. Um, do, 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 do. Ah, there, there we, we go. go. Thank you. Great. So, um, for depending on how cooperative the critter is, you you can make your drawings bigger, smaller. You can get a bunch of poses, um, or you know, you might have just a, a really cooperative beastie. I'm going to just um, draw this one out um, a little bit more. That's what I should have started with, that, that line along the back. Follow the head. And then I often look like, like right where the you know necks hit into the ball. Sometimes there's like it's a little bulge. You find interesting angles in these areas where heads meet bodies. So always kind of focus on on whatever critter you're looking at on on where those those go. Um, this bird has lots of undertail coverts. I mean I mean uh, belly feathers here that are covering up. Wing. The wing is, I'll often figure out where the tip of the wing is, often drawing the leading edge of the wing in as the way that I will start drawing wings. Here's my primaries. My secondaries are going to be in here. And covert feathers are going to be covering up that top part of my wing. No. Don't feel that you have to draw in from head to toe all the details of the bird. Um, you can, if you wish, just focus on a few key spots that you want to get. So for instance, on this little one, I am going to focus on um, the head and a few parts of the body. So if you were with me uh, for a, a, a recent class which we, where we're talking about kind of drawing a landscape and then picking part of that landscape and working in those details. I'm gonna be doing essentially the same thing here with this grouse. It's got all this complex pattern and I'm not gonna be drawing the, the grouse from head to tail. What I'm gonna do is just pick a few parts of the grouse that I am really interested in. So they have a little tiny beak And I'm going to give it a round eye. It's got a nice dark eye. And as I darken that in, I'm going to leave a little bit of a highlight on the top edge of it, make it feel like there's some sunlight hitting it. And what I want to get is that little crescent of skin. It is above the eye. That's just such an interesting thing. The bird has some white spots on its head. And so what I'm gonna do is just sort of trace around what those white spots are and sort of think of those as my kind of positive shape. So where are the white spots on the head? There's one that's back here. So I've kind of drawn those in with the tip of my pencil. And then I can fill in around those with the gray of the head. You see that I'm able to cover a bunch of paper really real estate really quickly. Like watch what happens on this black throat here. Um, because my pencil is really dull this is a, and broad, this is a 0.7 millimeter mechanical pencil with 2B lead in it. And that allows me very quickly to get a big area of tone. And it doesn't look like, if I did this with a fine skinny pencil, 
and I tried to cover up a large area, I would get something that looked like a whole bunch of lines, right? But because my pencil is this really broad tipped thing, I can get these kind of areas of tone in very, very easily. And I'm going to put in a little bit of just the salt and pepper of these things. Now, that's one area that interests me. So I'm going to do that part of the bird. <clears throat> Another thing that really interests me is down here at the base of its tail, where um, the bird has these um, cool covert feathers that stick out on the tail and they make these bars. So I'm just gonna kind of get in here and I'm gonna draw some of these bars. And here are there's my undertail coverts, uh, a little fluff in them, and they have a few dark marks in here. So what you're seeing here is that I don't need to, I can have a larger picture and on a complex bird just sort of get places where I will kind of get in some details and I can focus on the parts that I can see well and the parts that I'm the most interested in. Um, in this part of the bird, um, there are a bunch of those little, those white crescents, those little white trumpet shapes, and a bunch of little white patterns. And that's on top of a matrix that is overall, overall dark gray or dark brown with some, um, dark gray or dark brown with uh, black accents in it. So I'm going to show you I'm a, a kind of a, a quick little trick here that um, I'm going to do. I'm going to, if, when I think about like a lot of how I approach this will depend what I have in my sketching kit. Um, and if I have something that allows me to put down some opaque white in my kit, then I can do the trick that I'm about to do. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to just put in a bunch of the, so I can, I'm going to do just an area of just like this on the bird here. And I'm going to drop my details right into there. All right, so on the belly, I have all these cool bars. And if you look at an individual feather that comes down, that feather is going to have several kind of lines of bars that go over it. All of these are overlapping together. So I'm just trying to generally get the direction of these. I'm not trying to match the pattern line for line, spot for spot, but I've got overall vertical lines in here. And these are all gray. So I have, now I'm going to,
watercolor on this. On the upper part of the back, the ground color is more grayish. On the lower part of the, the body, it's sort of a grayish brown. So I'm going to come in here and I want this to be dark enough that it's going to give the bird an overall dark tone. More grayish up here. There we go. That's good. Now I'm going to let that dry. Hold on a moment. I'm going to hit mine with a hair dryer. I think a little bit. Oh, uh, no. Let's see. There we go. Oh, oh. Oh, here. Oh. Almost. There we go. A little bit right. more to the right. If I move this to just this way a little bit, then you get to see the yep. head as well. Sorry about the, the wiggly there. Yeah, um, so, and then I can use a variety of tools to get. Um, those, those white patterns on it. Um, so one tool that I will often use is, this is a Presto, what is it, like the Biggie Jumbo Correction Pen. And you can think of it as um, it's essentially kind of almost like whiteout in, it's a whiteout pen. And what I'm going to do is this is going to be unforgiving. Once I put it down, it's there. But um, actually, first, let me just get a few of those darks to be darker darks. This is going to give me an order of operations here. I'm first going to finish my darks, then I'm going to get in there with that jumbo correction pen. Um, so here is just a little bit of you know, there's 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 barring on the side of this bird. There you go. Now, I'm going to just take this white pen and draw in some of those marks. First, going to just test it off on the side because sometimes it makes globs that are much, much bigger than I want. And even though that this is, I'm just going to kind of take my time with this, not press too hard. I don't want to squeeze hard on it or I'll get a big white glob. Um, and whatever I get, I'm, I'm going to be stuck with. So there's, I'm gonna put in a few of these marks. Some places it will feel too blobby for me. And that's just sort of the nature of this pen. Go. 
And that allows me to fairly quickly get a um, get those patterns on the, the body of my bird. Come in here. Let's say I, oops, I put dark all over the head of my bird. I'm not going to stress about that. I'm, say, I'm just going to come back later with my my jumbo correction pen and see if I can jumbo correct that. In the meantime, I'm going to get myself a little dark throat. Some dark on my head. Notice that the edges of that head feel pretty kind of scrambled, but those crisp up nicely if you kind of come around with a just a, a bolder pencil line at the end. <clears throat> now I'm going to take my correction pen and put those whites back in. So I've got fast sketching. I have putting my um, I've got fast sketches. I've got using words in there. I can do little outtake boxes that show kind of details of how I want to put in um, little kind of white elements. If I do a larger drawing, I don't even have to think of that as a head to toe thing. If there's part of the critter that I can see well, I can fill that in. If there's a detail that I want to get, I can sort of drop that in. And then use these sorts of notes, put those together. If I want to later on do kind of a head to toe portrait of the entire thing. Um, but those might be just a few strategies and ideas about how to play with this grass. And Walters, sorry if we didn't get to the bird with the open mouth. I hope that, uh, let's see, where's my other view here? <clears throat> I hope that these uh, some of these strategies are going to be um, helpful in if you are working on your grouse drawing, but also sort of you can think about these for strategies of not getting overwhelmed by any complex subject. Um, what I'm going to do so that I don't kind of go like, oh my gosh, little grouse, you've got all these complex things, so I'm not even going to start. I can simplify it, just I'm going to try to get the basic shape of your body, and I'm going to play with that. Where are the major dark parts on your body? Um, all sorts of birds, like ducks, they, they have these little these feathers that have all these little squiggly lines on them. And these are they actually the, this, the, the feathers on ducks that have all the tiny little squiggly lines. Um, they look like kind of like worms all crawling in the same direction. 
the name for that is vermiculation. So um, after sort of after the, the the Latin root for worm. So like vermiculture is like you know gardening with your worms. Um, so vermiculation on feathers is this like crazy little like uh, and if you get in there, you can get lost in all the little details, and your thing won't feel like the 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 beast or you look at the the duck with vermiculation on it like i can't even start with you just simplify that shape go for big areas take take an area of like like here what i initially did is i took this area that was these these black and gray or brown stripes with little white spots into that and on my sketch again that was just that was just a gray tone or cross hatching and um, then you can have little notes in there about what those patterns are. You can have some call out boxes showing like what the patterns in here are doing or what the patterns in here are doing. You can make a larger drawing and show the parts of that that are really exciting and interesting to you. Um, similarly with the landscape drawing, um, you can have you know, a, a, a big landscape drawing of all sorts of of, of features of something that are interesting to you. And then you can take part of that and put a little frame around it and put your watercolor in there. And then this other part over here, um, you can do a little watercolor over that part. And so you've got this generally loose picture with a few parts where you're collecting some notes and details. That also just makes the, the whole thought of kind of entering into this complex subject easier to do. And so don't get overwhelmed by a complex subject. You can use words to describe those complexities. You can do little call out boxes for the complexities. And, and you're basically doing what's kind of appropriate for the level of detail that you can see from that distance and how cooperative the bird is being. Really uncooperative bird, you have a silhouette a silhouette of the bird, and that's it. Um, really cooperative bird, you know, you can get in there and noodle in all those details of feathers. We realize that a lot of the field guides, when you look at these super complex drawings and field guides, the artist who did those was not sitting out in the middle of a meadow drawing the woodcock and putting all those, you know, little marks on it. What that person was doing is they had field notes, you put those together with study skins, you put those together with photographs, you put all those different resources together, you then create the drawing that goes boop, into the field guide. So don't put pressure on yourself to kind of get all that fussiness um, when you're out there and you know the mosquitoes are biting and the wind is blowing and your fingers are getting numb and you're, but, but you can do this. It's, it's, it's fun to do. So pick out what's interesting to you. If you're really into the head, get into the head. Don't feel like you're supposed to do anything, but find what is interesting to you and make notes and document about that. And remember, the moment that you start writing on your journal page, a ton of the art pressure will vanish. So try that. Thank you all for being here, and I hope that this was useful. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna jump over to Community Cam, and we're gonna first go to can we start with you, Ray Bonto? Yeah, all right, we're gonna jump over to Ray Bonto. This, um, the grouse was his request. You've been really patient for a bunch of weeks um, about, uh, about the grouse. Oh, and you, you said to do it with pencils. I forgot <laughs> until now, but uh, let's see what you have. Um, I'm going to add you to the spotlight. We're going to make it possible for you to unmute yourself. I think you can do that now. And so you can unmute yourself. So, um, I. Ah. Um, just did a quick sketch of um, the first brows and hi I just sketched in the annotations um, the ones nice. where I change colors I change colors the ones where you change colors I change colors 
Excellent. Oh, and something that I, I, I want to notice that your birds have a real solidity to them. Um, they, they, they feel like they have volume and they would have a weight to them um, because you have that, 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 that nice character of line, that bold line um, that's really helping me sort of feel that this, this bird has, has substance to it. Um, I, I really like the way you are, 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 are putting that in. It reminds me of the work of a British bird artist much like yourself. Well, let me see if I can. Um, I'm going to um, bring up on my screen. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Check this out. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, just sort of take over control of the screen for a moment. But I, what I want you to see is that there, there's, a, there's a really interesting similarity in your line weights and what um, uh, Eric uh, Enyan does. Yeah, um, I've heard of him. He's in uh, Rossi's book. Yeah. I, yes, uh, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah, um, I've seen the pictures. They're quite nice. I, I like looking at them a lot. Yeah, so here is just uh, kind of some Eric Enyan examples. Um, and you can see what's kind of going on is that, um, you know, there's, there, there's, there's that, there's that bold line that is, 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 is punching it in. Um, let's take a look at, uh, these guys. Yeah, look at that. Um, so a lot of your line energy reminds me of the style. And, and Volters, you'll, you'll dig this. I mean, just check out this um, toned paper, little bit of gouache on that, and pow. Oh, we'll just check out one more here. Um, This, these sketches here are reminding me very much, I mean, just these birds are just liquid and alive and they mm. have a solidity to, to them. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, that's, that's a substantial bird. You could pick that bird up in your hand. Um, love that line variation. Um, so now I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna stop this share. I'm gonna jump back to you. So everybody take, take, take a look at sort of, you know, these, the, you know, like the variable line weight, those bold lines. Oh, great. Studying the leg postures there. Yeah. Uh, um, so here's the wing, I did that in green. Here's the tail, I did that in uh, magenta. Yeah, here oh. is a magenta pencil. Um, the name is magenta. Um, that this one. Yep. And but but but, but it's not yeah. quite the magenta, right? Yeah. All right. Nice. I like it. I do too. So, um, yeah. I also use black raspberry. Um, and that's what I use for blocking in these. Oh, so those are, are you're putting those in with a colored pencil that that's with the black raspberry colored pencil it kind of gives you that nice dark that nice dark line. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and I've got a few nature journal pages. Oh, we would love to see them. Please, please do share. I'm out in the field and I'm sketching pigeons. <laughs> and the uh, once I even on Saturday, I saw a cold it even. I, I, would, I, I am so envious of that. I mean, what a crazy looking bird. And what a cool angle. I love that angle on the um, cold tip. And, and this is a pigeon. Mm -hmm. And 
over here. I also went on sketching pigeons, but this is not the one I uh, wanted to yeah. do. That so. line variation, I mean, th these birds really have a solidity to them. This is great. Uh, toned paper, again. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> yes. A squirrel. I even saw the strange bird, which had a black bird head, but its body was too fat and it was too big. Oh, so interesting. Was it a very cold day by any chance? It was, I don't know, it wasn't cold. Because sometimes a bird will really fluff its feathers out when it gets cold. Imagine if you ha were wearing a down jacket and you could make your down jacket thicker when you're cold or thinner when you're hot. So they will move the angle of their feathers. And when it's really cold, their feathers go out to give them a jacket with more loft, more thickness in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So could, could we see that, that, that sketch of the blackbird uh, like one again? This one. Yeah. Yeah, it, the, the posture of it feels very, very Blackbird to me. Um, so, and when Ray Bonto and I are talking about Blackbirds, what we actually mean is the real Blackbird that you've heard in the song Blackbird Singing in the Dead of Night, right? So the Blackbird in Europe is a thrush and our Blackbird um, is an Ectirid. So the, um, the so they're, they're, in, they're, 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 they're different groups of, of birds and so that one feels very, very threshy to me. Um, that posture, that kind of lean and a little bit of the head up feels very, very threshy. Um, and, uh, okay, go on. Oh, I'm, I'm done. Please continue. And this was yesterday. Uh, Turn to paper again uh, and so this white thing, I suppose it's a dog. Uh, so I put it on toned paper. I also saw this strange word with a white cap, a pigeon. Yes, um, there, there is so much breeding that has been done, selective breeding by humans to make pigeons look all sorts of crazy ways. Oh, this is really fun. And I love those toned paper sheets uh, clipped into there like that. Yeah. Uh... Usually use tape. Yeah. But I uh, found tape. Uh, it takes up a bit of the space, and then you can't draw in that tape space. Mm -hmm. So I really put a small cross of tape like that now. Um, like, and today was the best day ever. <laughs> okay, we can't wait. We can't wait. We gotta see. We gotta see. Yay. Hey, everybody, here comes the best day ever. Yeah, we saw this, I saw some, I, I, I heard a noise, I looked up and I saw some birds fighting and they were moving so fast I couldn't identify them. I only saw white things moving around, um, fighting each other. Uh, and, but one did sit. And it turned out to be this strange green bird. I didn't remember the uh, one, uh, the head color, so I didn't draw it. But, however, that's not the uh, bit. Wait, wait hold, hold those a little bit closer to the screen so we could see it, if, if possible. I don't, um, it's, it's hard to do. Do you want to first tell the, 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 the story and then? Yeah. OK. I, yeah, this was the best. I saw uh, something uh, um, like a bird sat on uh, a tree and I just had time to identify it. It turned out to be a goldfinch. Oh, yes. And yeah. so hold, hold that closer to the screen, if you would. Yeah, with that with that beautiful red on the face. Yeah, your goldfinch has these incredible colors. We don't have that kind of goldfinch out here with the red on the face. Oh, this is so much fun. 
Yeah. Hmm. And, um, I went to the top of the park where I usually, um, do my nature journaling where you saw all those pigeons. Um, so I saw this pigeon, that pigeon. This was a coal tit. I saw it again. And I realized that this had been a coal tit. Oh, how interesting. Because of its green breast. Oh, that is so cool. The, the, so the coal tit has a little bit of a wash of green on it. How fun yeah. to have that mystery solved for you. And, and what, what I really respect about what you're doing is you're, you're taking notes, you're describe, you're showing what you see. There's part that you didn't see. So you're perfectly happy to leave that out, even if it's the head. Other people go like, I have to draw the head in. But you're saying like, if I don't see the head, I'm just not going to draw that for now. Maybe I'll get another look at this bird there. And then later on, boom, there it is. You see the green again. You put those pieces together. This is really good observation. This is very exciting. Yeah, that was pigeon two. Uh, I just, um, I just stick in a bit of toned paper and take it out every day. Um, and yeah, and I've got good news for you. Yesterday, I cleaned my pencil brush, and it's working fine. Excellent. Excellent. Did you see the, the video that uh, we, we put up on? Um, no. Ah. I, I didn't. I just decided to clean it my own way. I um, opened it up put, uh, and put a bit of soap in, in, poured a bit of soap into this area and put some uh, water in here and shook it. Uh, and then uh, I opened up, opened it up and put the tap at full force down at this uh, place to get the soap going and out. Oh, that's uh, great. Then oh. when I opened up the brush, it was working fine. Uh, some soap co started coming out, <laughs> but I, uh, and, and then, uh, I saw some brown stuff coming out of it. Well, it looks like you fleshed it out. That's terrific. Um, I put up a video on the uh, Nature Journal Club Facebook page. I think uh, Linda uh, Y uh, got me to this. Um, it, and, it, and I've also got a link to it from the page on my store where I describe the water brush. And it's got where this person takes that brush apart, disassembles it, cleans it out, and puts it back together. There apparently, there, you'll see that there's a number of small parts that um, can also get clogged. So if it clogs again, you might want to check that video out. Really proud of you for taking the initiative and getting your water brush up and going again. Well done. And Jack, uh, I've got a recommendation and a question. Okay. Uh, my recommendation uh, is some wash. If Nobody is available to uh, the one that Jack uses. There's this wash called Pibio um, wash, and and that's extremely high quality. Plus, it's it's much more it has much more wash than yours, Jack. Oh, fantastic! So <laughs> it is called Pibio. Yeah, Pibio. Yeah, you, you know it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it comes in a tube of 100 ml. Okay. Um, and and is it is the letter P, then the letter B, and then the letter O, PBO? Um, yeah, that one with uh, where the masking tape came on, that PBO. Oh. Um, oh, okay. I, I, will, I will, I'll try to... To, to look for this. Um, if anybody finds um, a link to this, please put it in. Uh, um, yeah, uh, it's high quality and it doesn't crack. Oh, game on. Um, P-E-B-E-O, uh, Martha says. All right, I'm, I'm writing this down. Um, I'll try to find a link. Wait, 
Hey, thank you so much. We appreciate you doing um, all of this uh, product testing for us. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank my you. question was, um, um, my mechanical pencil, it's also 2B and it doesn't go so dark. Ooh. Um, I, I, I wonder if not all 2Bs are, are made the same, or it's also possible that just my 2B on, uh, when you see it come through the screen, it looks darker, higher contrast than, than it actually is. Um, but you will find that you will be able to get much better darks with that 2B. It will be more smudgy, though. It will be more smudgy. Yeah, that's why you use some bound books. And um, Jack, uh, if you want to get um, in the dark areas extremely quickly, get, uh, I think you might like one of those fat mechanical pencils. Ooh, um, they've got something like a 5.6 to 7 millimeter lead. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this, is, this is a, a point 0.7. No, 7 millimeter, not 0. Oh, 7. not not point 0.7, but 7 millimeter. Oh, wow. And there's also 0.6 millimeters. And when you want to get a fine point, you just sharpen it with a knife. Nice. That's That's good to know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, I'm now going over um, Ivea. Thank you so much for um, for helping us with um, you, uh, with the, the the program today. Um, what's up in your journal? I'm happy to help. So if you are, are in Brian's class, you might have already seen this, but because you were talking about field notes today, I wanted to share some stuff um, from the field at my restoration site. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was able to return to doing habitat restoration work. And so initially I, I tried to draw it out like this um, so that at least I would be able to see the contours. Then went back and sort of put in um, gray ink the areas where I'm gonna be having to work so that that way it's just the areas where, you know, with the plants. Um, and then took some notes about the technique I was going to use uh, in order to take out the, the cape ivy, which is kind of infesting my site, <laughs> mm. and um, made a little sketch map in the field of priority one area. Um, and so, as you can see, it's not like super detailed or anything. It's not perfect, but it's it shows the the very vague area of where all of the uh, shrubs are, so that that way I know which areas to free first from the cape ivy and what can act as sort of anchor points. Um, so, um, yeah, hard to explain. Um, That's cool. But then I wanted to share what you'd said about birds. It made me think about this particular drawing that I'd made in the field. I couldn't get a very good glimpse of this because it was in some Ceanothus shade and currently doing some digging and then making a couple of holes. And sorry, my cat is trying to be all up in this. And, um, <laughs> and so because I, I was trying to use my binoculars, but I couldn't get a very good glimpse. And at first, you know, I, I felt kind of badly that I couldn't do um, more detailed sketching, but then I remembered what you said about just draw what you can see. Um, and so that's what I did the little bit that I could. And so I wrote down as many notes as possible about things I noticed about like the white markings up in here, um, about where I saw the white around the eye and the behaviors. And then um, when I was telling Brian's class about it, I realized that I was gonna start calling it the mustache snowdrop bird until I can learn the proper name. Cause at least that way I can remember what it's called. Um, but oh, that's this is fine. What, this is what field notes can look like. You know, they're yeah. not polished, they're not pretty, but they're useful, they're informative, and that's that's what matters. And um, and and being useful is that's as scientists, that's where we want to hang our hat. Um, and we just want, and if you want, you know, the more you do it, the more the 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 you end up getting pictures that are prettier and prettier because you're just kind of wiring that part of your brain. But that can't be our objective, or it just locks us up. I love these. Um, the integration of the words and the pictures, and also that you're coming up with your own name for it. Um, you don't know who it is yet. And at some point, um, 
you know, you will have a, um, you, you know, you, you, you might associate this one with, you know, the, the AOU name, but, you know, the name is not the thing, it's the looking um, and it's the paying attention. Digging behavior in Duff and Twigs. Was this a fairly kind of maybe a little bit smaller than a um, than a robin, but bigger than a sparrow? I'd say yes. That sounds about right. And overall brownish. Mm -hmm. um, white streaks on breast like snowdrops. Oh, this is this is. This is going to be fun to, 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 to look for. This is great. I'm excited about this because I, I'm wondering, of course, what it was digging for and what it could have possibly been eating, but I couldn't tell. But because I was also recently told that bird nesting season began in our area. So I'm wondering if I'll be seeing this one again, especially because it was in the shade of this particular Ceanothus bush, which if, if folks don't know it, it's this, it's this shrub that's some, that usually grows a bit taller even than coyote brush. So it gets to be above my head um, even, and I'm 5'4". And I'm so that's, for me, I'm curious to know if that's where they're gonna be nesting or not, because yeah. we're told that once you get to a certain, oh yeah, sorry. Um, I also started to draw some of what the what the um, cape ivy that I pulled up looked like. Some of the ones that don't look typical because they don't have the leaves still attached. And so people would see these nondescript twigs and stems and think, oh, the cape ivy is dead. You know, there's no need to worry about this, but this is how they come back. Mm. Just like this. Yeah. Just this little bit that's, you know, looks like just been ripped off pieces. This is how it comes back every time. So it just looks innocent when we're freeing the plants that we have to look, I mean, I have a lot of respect for this particular plant that we pull out, um, but but you have to be cautious of it because it can come back so easily. Um, sorry, so what I was saying about the um, bird nesting season is that that's what I was told. And so when I was there on Friday, I told I was told it just began. And I looked up the hillside and saw these ceanothus that had the, um, the, the cape ivy going up into the canopies. And because uh, the nesting season had only just begun on March the 1st, I was thinking, okay, it's close enough to, you know, to the beginning that I should just pull it down because otherwise they'll have five months to infest the canopy with nothing to stop it because yeah. it's, it's August when bird nesting season ends again. And so I was yanking it down and going, no canopy for you. Oh, that is so great. I love this. You know, what, something that is just beautiful about this is that, um, you know, as, you know, you're letting yourself also be in the story. And these, th this, this will just remind you of those experiences so much. Yeah. Um, so not just a description of the plant, but our relationships and interactions with things. And oh, here's the details of the Cape Ivy. Yeah. Oh, this is fun. It, what you said about us being part of the story. This is this is my this. Okay, so sometimes you'll hear Marley talk about bread and butter, juice, and growth edge. And the juice is the thing that makes you really, really excited. And that just like, you have endless energy when you encounter it. And for me, when I find nature journaling and habitat restoration combined, that's my juice. That's what gets me excited because we are part of the store. We have to write that down um, when we're doing the restoration because we're not just observing the environment, we're changing it. And so you want to keep good notes because then you find out, did the changes that we wrought upon the environment work? Did they make the environment healthier? Did they not work? And do we have to rethink our strategies? And then you can look back and say, this is the strategy I used. Where did I, where do I need to tweak this? That's, mm -hmm. that's my juice, so. That's great. So thank you for listening. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. It's so cool to see this, um, you know, the, the connection between the journaling and the stewardship. Thank you. And your um, your role modeling has worn, uh, rubbed off on a lot of us. There's a number of people now in this group who've gone out for, you know, birthday beach cleanings and stuff like that. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm next going to jump over to um, to Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science, and you've got just grouse tastic going on here. <laughs> Lots of fun. And I had so many reminds me of and wonderings. Um, reminds me a little bit of California quail, this kind of look. Mm -hmm. And um, chickens and turkeys and um, 
but I wonder if it's related to the sage grouse that we have way up in Northern California, up in Lassen County. Mm -hmm. And we are doing restoration work with Point Blue conservation scientists and the local ranchers up there to try to protect the habitat for the sage grouse. Um, and I've had a wonderful field trip up there that was really interesting. And maybe it's something we could do sometime, Jack, is, is highlight. Did you get out with the sage grouse when they were lecking? Yes, went to the lecking. Oh, lecking. you. Got up at, you know, four in the morning so we could be there at sunrise and froze our mm, off. And um, it was just so cool and beautiful. And we were at quite a distance, but still, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. So um, yeah, thank you so much for this session. And oh yeah, it reminds me of Groucho Marx with the- uh, Oh yes. <laughs> eyebrow things, but yeah, lots that's of fun. That's fun. Oh, that's really fun. So and I like how even in these, these notes here in the class, you're doing the, I notice, I wonder it reminds me of. Just the more that you make that your habit on everything you do and everything you look at, that is, that is really, really good. So, and are they um, pretty similar to the sage grouse and the spruce grouse? Are they? Um, they're, they are related. So they're in the same group, but um, sort of different branches um, on the same bush. Yeah. All right, well, we can talk if you wanna do a sage grouse thing sometime. So you're saying that you might help facilitate a Nature Journal Club field trip to Northern California to get to be with the sage grouse on their leks. Um, I'm in. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I think that uh, that we could. I think that we could we could have some crazy fun. Super. We'll get Ray Bonto. And and then then what we've got to do is. Uh, somehow uh yeah get a uh plane flight across the ocean so falters and ray bonto yeah, can uh, we'll join us out there with that got a fist pump on that one yeah excellent all right um so who else would like to share something all right um i'm first going to go to nicholas and then over to Valters. um and uh spotlight hey there good to see you Hello, Roy. Thank you again for a great class. And uh, in, in, in fact, also, it's the first time I'm really not worried about writing some something on, on my drawings. So it's I've been always a bit shy of, of mixing what is drawing and what is writing. And I, part of it also, I think my writing is not great at all. But I, I um, so I wanted to also uh, think about how we could still get volume ideas in that because we focused a lot on pattern, but still, I, I, I still see my uh, drawing as a flat thing compared to the fluffiness of the pictures we saw before. So I'm not sure I, I was able to, to, to get that. Yeah. But, um, and, and I like that just, just sort of also just in terms of graphic visual organization. Everybody notice how um, Nicholas just put a little box around those quick gesture sketches up there and notice how that visually chunks those. Isn't that interesting? So um, on your own journal pages, you can do the same thing. Um, like I'm just gonna take my page here and I am going to draw a little box around that. And so I, I now, yeah, nice. just, you know, in terms of graphic organization, the page is now less confusing. It's easier for your brain to kind of chunk these things as a unit. And it looks cool. Yeah, I like the idea of having the head of the bigger one into the other one, like you did. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And that more interesting that the first tries, uh, like the when you were showing the pictures, that when I don't see like so much uh, life than when we have. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> that's really cool to see. And I tried to do uh, some kind of uh, be uh, William Berry uh, imitation uh, when we had the first picture, but just to work with the. Uh, 
the pen still mm -hmm. there. So that was the the idea. But it, I grew a bit uh, sad of how much work you, you are needed to do with so much feathers and so much patterns. But uh, right. I, so that yeah, that's why you want to give yourself permission to leave some parts just like. You can have a sketch like this, and if there's some part of it that you want to noodle in, noodle in that part, and you can leave mm -hmm. the rest as an unfinished drawing. It actually looks visually more interesting if you leave parts of a drawing mm -hmm. unfinished. So things are at different stages. Some parts are just really sketchy. Some parts have a little bit of the line work worked in, and other parts you've dropped in color on them is actually visually more interesting because it then tells the story of the process than one where you completed the entire drawing. True, that, that's true. And then uh, I was afraid of that at the, at the way before. And I think all your classes helped me be confident with just few lines, uh, not all the, the details in. And that's uh, that's very helpful because I was imagining if I come back to this drawing, like maybe in uh, one, two, and three lines, we have everything for the birds. Like if we have just one line here, here, and here. Yes. Up, yes. We have we had it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You so just it just so it. it's neat to see how sometimes this is just one of these kind of great less is more moments, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. And uh, also, uh, my son William wanted to have a little chat with you or uh, a species that is uh, really keen on seeing you again for the spring when the spring arrives here. Oh, great. William, we'd love to see what you have. Mm, yeah. Oh, the osprey? Yeah. Oh, aren't those fun? And if you, you really have that long winged look of this bird. They have such long, 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 and notice everybody kind of that bend in the wing. Ospreys, when you see them, they look that very kind of bendy, very floppy wing. Um, that's really fun. Yeah. That's and really I fun. wanted to know how to do the shades over here on the top of the wing to make them look more like shade, shady. Yeah. Um, well, maybe what we should do is um, do a whole another workshop on birds in flight, raptors in flight. Uh, oh. Would you be into that? Yeah. Oh yes. All right. Let me um, note to self. Uh, yep. So let, what we'll do, uh, William, is we'll get a class coming up soon on on drawing raptors in flight. And um, in that, um, you want to, you, to be able to, to put the watercolor on it and kind of think about how the shadows and those things work on a bird that is, is flying in the sky. Um, I think that would be really fun. There are aspects of that that I've never put in any class. And um, so that would be something with some cool new material. But mm -hmm. I like what you've got there. I really like what you've got. Could you hold up your Osprey one more time? Yep. Very good. Very good. You're, um, you've got really good observations of the angles of feathers in there. Um, so you uh, had to look really hard to, to get that because often what people think should be there, it's not what's there. And so uh, you're, um, William, your, your, your drawing really suggests to me some careful observation there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's jump over to um, Walters. Good to see you. Hi, nice to see you. So I just wanted to share a project that I've been do doing uh, all through the winter this year and I've been building uh, bird nest boxes. Uh, and uh, also we have some already in the woods uh, uh, school 
school, uh, our local school put them out. So I have taken, I went out in the woods and kind of put numbers on the nest boxes and wrote down how higher are they from the ground and what forests are there. So I'm gonna, this year, this spring, I'm gonna be monitoring about 40 nest boxes of uh, to see what different birds uh, nest there and um, really excited I also I also built uh, five uh, do you know a bird uh, hoopoe is that heard of uh, Eurasian the... European hoopoe oh 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 hoopoe. yes 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 that that this, so this is a crazy crazy looking bird and it also is one of the ones with usually you know, nobody pays attention to the Latin names of birds, but this one here. Oop, oop, uh, pops. Yes, it, 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 it's it, it is it's fun to say. Oop, 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 oops. Mm -hmm. ah! I mean, it looks like just some like a, a made up bird. I mean, this thing is just crazy town. Mm -hmm. um, so so, so um, on this, you, you, you said you saw did you see one or that you are? No. Still, uh, I had one a couple of years ago nesting in one of the nest boxes that I put up. And uh, now I will put up uh, five nest boxes for this bird this year. And I also have uh, built a couple of nest boxes for wagtails and flycatchers. And then a couple of uh, uh, nest boxes for tits, uh, call tit, great tit, blue tit, and stuff like that. So here just uh, here's just uh, uh, the numerizing and how I cut, categorize them. And so there are the numbers, different, uh, different uh, uh, nest boxes have different numbers. So it's going to be fun to see the data uh, at the end of the year. What do I have nesting there? Yeah. Um, and also, I, I just want to say how impressed I am at what you are doing um, as a steward of wildlife nearby. That is so cool. That is so impressive. Um, the, uh, I'd like to, to, to bring Ivea uh, in here, who's also really um, in, involved in stewardship in our in our concert on our conversation here um the um the uh, I'd love to get your 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 thoughts on what you're seeing there just hearing that you are building these bird boxes makes first of all i want to take a workshop from you about how to do that and where you put them and what you observe